The Week in Doubt, episode 280. Hey everyone, I'm Phil Albertelli, the host of The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. Before we start, I'd like to thank Buster Tomashko, I think it is, for liking The Week in Doubt Facebook page. Thank you very much, much appreciated. And so this is going to be yet another, you guessed it, unscripted episode. I was kind of slaving away on some bonus content and didn't have time to get around to writing a script, although I knew pretty much uh, in my head what I exactly what I wanted to talk about this week. It's funny, last weekend uh, I was in the mood to record some Patreon bonus content, so I thought I'd sit down and quickly record a kind of point-by-point response to this relatively short clip of Jordan Peter, yes, Jordan Peterson again, Jordan Peterson being interviewed by Vice. The interview went kind of viral, and it's been considered to be controversial by some. On the one hand, you have some people accusing Jordan Peterson of saying uh, some sexist things regarding women in the workplace and sexual harassment. And on the other side, you have Jordan Peterson proponents arguing that Vice did kind of a hatchet job and perhaps edited the interview in kind of an unfair way. So I thought maybe this would be like 20 minutes, half an hour at the most. I ended up recording myself for nearly four hours. And uh, through the magic of editing, I've whittled it down to about three and a half hours. And I'm, I'm still slogging away. So hopefully relatively soon, you Patreon supporters can... Uh, expect to see a heap and helping of bonus content and I might actually pull some clips out of there too to post on YouTube and at some point I might post the thing in its entirety on YouTube and be forewarned somewhere around the middle I start to become pretty sloshy shall we say uh, I, I think I ended up drinking I don't know somewhere like five or six hard ciders and a relatively short span of time. Uh, So things go a little bit off the rails, hopefully in a fun kind of way. And I think I somehow eventually end the whole thing by commenting on a Walking Dead video. So there you have it. I'm kind of hoping you guys out there who prefer the longer episodes are going to have a field day with it. (laughs) And I'm definitely looking forward to see how people react to it. I'm hoping it's a kind of epic, beautiful train wreck of an episode. But anyway, onward. So I'm trying to decide if I want to take care of the listener feedback first or if I want to tackle the news first. This week's listener feedback I think is going to be pretty entertaining, but at the same time there's some pretty poignant news stories to take care of. So maybe I'll just flip for it. And uh, you guys won't be able to see the coin toss, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Let's see. Heads, news stories. What do we get? And I lost the coin. I'm always telling you guys about how bad I was at sports as a kid. Apparently, some things haven't changed. I can't even flip a coin properly. Uh, let's see. Tails, listener feedback. Okay. The die is cast, the coin is tossed. Listener feedback it is. Okay, so before I get to the really good stuff, I'll quickly try to take care of some feedback that was recently left on my St. Patrick's Day video. And I actually just re-released that uh, via the Podbean feed. So it should be entitled TWID Replay, A Brief History of St. Patrick. And I'm actually blown away by how well this video version is doing on YouTube. Over 25,000 views. And... uh, As other YouTubers have said, most viewers don't even bother to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's usually a small proportion who do, but it has 141 up votes and only 7 down votes, so pretty cool. And uh, before I address the specific comment that I had in mind, I'll read some of these other ones. There's even a lot that seem to be coming from believers, which makes sense since it's uh, the history of a saint we're dealing with. Like someone here, Dark Hawk X says, Blessed is the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, 
And, you know, I'm an agnostic atheist, you know. Uh, so Dark Hawk and I aren't exactly uh, going to see eye to eye on this. But nevertheless, I just gave him a thumbs up because it, it seems like he watched the video. He got something out of it. Uh, perhaps he found it inspiring uh, as a person of faith, <laughs> ironically. And I should say, when I do these type of episodes, I'm not trying to debunk anything. I'm actually coming at them from the point of view of someone who has a love of history and who's fascinated by the subject of religion and the lives of the saints and that kind of thing. So when I do these documentary episodes, uh, such as this one, I I'm not really coming with at it with any atheist agenda. So, uh, you know, I welcome believers, non-believers alike. I, I hope whatever your worldview is, you can get something out of these uh, documentary episodes. And uh, for some reason, I think it's kind of nice that believers are liking a, uh, a documentary I made. And here's Bobby, uh, Bobby B5. And I, I haven't heard from him in a while. We used to talk uh, every week via YouTube. We used to always comment on the videos. He says, fascinating, disabuse me of the notion that St. Patrick was simply the guy that invented parades. Someone named Anne Price says, at the time, the people of Britain spoke Welsh until some of the tribes were pushed into what is now Wales. And I hope that's not a correction. I hope I didn't say something in the episode to contradict that. Maybe she's just trying to add to the conversation. Okay, so here's the one I want to address. Someone says he was kidnapped from their coast of Brittany in France. Fact check. And so I had always been under the impression, and this was further reinforced by the research I did for this episode, that St. Patrick was Romano-British and that uh, he, he basically came from Britain. He was kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery in Ireland. Um, but this person is saying France. And I like the fact that uh, they sound so sure about it. Like it's an ironclad fact. He was kidnapped from near the, he probably means the coast of Brittany in France. Fact check. I don't know if they're being a wise ass, but someone right underneath that says, for certain St. Patrick was not Irish. He was either Belgian or... R1A or Cherokee Neanderthal leading to the genetic event of Son of God, hashtag or number 29 King Arthur. <laughs> so it's either someone dicking around or it's, or it's a very sick person who needs help. Uh, either way, I'll, I'll, I'll pin it. <laughs> oh, and Anne Price chimes in again. St. Patrick was born in Wales or Pridane which is what Britain is, but has become Britain after the Anglo-Saxon invasion. The whole island spoke Welsh. And so that's a little out of my wheelhouse. I'll take Anne's word for it. Um, that's not what I'm trying to, you know, specifically address right now. I want to try to address this claim that St. Patrick was supposedly kidnapped from France instead of Britain. And I actually looked it up quickly earlier, and it turns out that there is some kind of newer competing, but I think still contested theory that uh, he may have been <laughs> French or from France. In fact, I'll reply to the person right now. Let's see. I believe that is a newer competing and still contested theory that I was unaware of at the time of recording this documentary. Okay, so here's an article from the Irish Times, and this actually dates back to 2013. So in fairness, I think that's before I did that uh, that episode. It says, I am Patrick, a sinner, is a disarmingly straightforward admission from the man credited with Christianizing the Irish. Little else concerning our patron saint is straightforward. Some scholars refer to him as the quote-unquote unknown apostle. 
And I think further uh, confusing things, I won't get into it too much right now, but there was some, or there is something rather known as the two Patrick's theory, that there may have been these, uh, these two different historical figures that were kind of conflated or fused into uh, one person. Not literally, you know, like in Dragon Ball Z, but uh, <laughs> by historians. The theory of St. Patrick's origins to which most scholars subscribe is that he was taken captive as a teenager from somewhere in Roman Britain and brought to Ireland. There is disagreement over where exactly in Britain he was seized. Some say a Roman settlement in Strathclyde. I am probably butchering the hell out of that. I think uh, my friend uh, Tim Danaher, is, is he, he's Welsh, I think. He, he'd probably know how to pronounce it. And he'd probably have something to add to the conversation. Others say Wales, and most of the rest suggest southwest England. But there has never been enough evidence to support any of these conclusively. A new book launched last week by the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin, Michael Jackson... <laughs> <laughs> I take it not that, Michael Jackson, may create ripples in scholarly and ecclesiastical circles over its claim that Patrick was in fact a native of what we now know as Brittany, not Britain. Rediscovering St. Patrick, a new theory of origins published by Columba Press, has been researched and written by a co-Wicklow-based Church of Ireland clergyman, Reverend Marcus Losack. He is an experienced pilgrimage leader and spiritual guide, as well as a lecturer at St. George's College in Jerusalem. And actually, I think Wicklow actually ties into the traditional story of Patrick. If I remember correctly, I think when he returned back from Britain to Ireland to spread Christianity, uh, I think legend has it he arrived by sea at Wicklow and was driven away and had to land elsewhere, I, I think. Okay, and so it says, his historical sleuthing began when he visited the Chateau de Bonabon, <laughs> whatever the hell, uh, or whatever the hell it is, near St. Mallow in Brittany more than four years ago and was told a local tradition that claims an earlier building on the site belonged to the late Roman period and was owned by St. Patrick's father, Calpurnius. That spurred Marcus Losak to undertake a grail-like quest to disentangle the threads of legend, tradition, and history in a bid to determine St. Patrick's provenance. In his confession, St. Patrick wrote that his father Calpurnius owned an estate, which in Latin he called Banavem Turbinii, I think, from where he was taken captive when he was about 16. The location of Benavem Turbinii, I think, was lost to historical memory in the years after Patrick's death. Okay, so it's saying that this person is arguing that that French chateau and Benevem, Turbinii or whatever, uh, as it's referred to in the Confession of uh, St. Patrick, that these are one and the same, which would mean, ostensibly, I guess, that um, Patrick may very well have been from Brittany, modern-day France. And it's saying it's not a completely new theory, um, as almost 200 years ago, another Irish scholar also proposed Patrick came from Brittany, but Reverend Losak has located a specific settlement and in doing so integrated a whole swath of new research. Involved is linguistics expert Christine Mormon, I think it is, who from a detailed study of Patrick's Latin suggested that there are definite Gaulish influences in his writings, influences that, in her opinion, could not have come from Scotland, Wales, or anywhere else in Britain. And it's talking about uh, an archaeological dig, and that supposed remains that date from the Roman era uh, were discovered in the basement in the 1870s, but unfortunately they have since been lost through renovations. Reverend Losak hopes an archaeological dig can take place that may reveal other evidence of a Roman settlement and possibly provide confirmation for his theory of St. Patrick's origins. Says, and if he is right, then his book fundamentally challenges our traditional image and understanding of St. Patrick and suggests we are misguided in that view of our patron saint. It also challenges our traditional understanding of where he came from and the truth about who he was, which in turn challenges our view of the origins of the Irish church and our understanding of our religious heritage and culture. 
Scissor's book touches fleetingly on another theory of the origins of Patrick, which concerns his family's descent from royalty and the possibility that his ancestors were Jewish. But that, as they say, is another story, or book as the case may be. <laughs> so it looks like this person may have been on some, not on something, that, that's more likely to be me, but they may have been on to something, so I may, I may actually owe them an apology. So I'm saying, hi, I was just reading about the Britney theory in an article from the Irish Times. It looks like I may owe you an apology. I don't think it's been proven conclusively, but the theory does seem to have Merit. And there's a bunch of other articles about this uh, Britney theory. Not, I maybe think of Britney Spears. And they all go back to uh, 2013, uh, right around the time that book was uh, launched or about to be launched. So it seems like an interesting theory. And as I just wrote in that comment to that person, uh, definitely not without merit. But also, like I said, I don't think it's been proven conclusively. But it's enough to make me worry. I'm like, oh shit, am I, am I going to have to uh, revise that documentary at some point in the future? Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll keep our eye on that. And this is one of those little tests, you know, that kind of uh, push the boundaries of your intellectual honesty. Because no one wants to be proven wrong, you know what I mean? Uh, I think it's natural to kind of want to dig your heels in the mud and um, stick with what you previously thought was right or whatever. Uh, you don't want to admit that you possibly made a mistake or an error. But um, if we're going to be intellectually honest, then we have to be open to being corrected, you know? So once again, I don't think... It hasn't been conclusively proven that Patrick came from Brittany rather than Britain. But we need to uh, stay open to new evidence. And if that's the way things go, if that's where the evidence takes us, that's where the evidence takes us, you know? You know, the consensus still seems to be that going by his confessio or confession, that he's claiming to be from Britain. At least that's the way it's been traditionally interpreted, I guess. According to the History Channel, and let's just remember they're the people who bring us ancient aliens, uh, Patrick was born in what is now England, Scotland. I've heard that before, too. Scotland or, once again, Wales. Wikipedia also says uh, Britain, for what it's worth. Irish Central says he was uh, kidnapped from the coast of what is known today as Great Britain. So I'm looking at the Confession of St. Patrick now. Uh, it says, translated from the Latin by Ludwig Beiler, or Beeler. Yeah, and it mentions Banovim. Is it, uh, I want to say Terbinii, because I think sometimes in Latin, A and E is pronounced with a long I sound, like the, the word Kylum, which I think refers to heaven or the firmament or something like that. But also, I think at the end of a word, it can be pronounced with a short A sound. And so it's ban of M, and then T-A-B-U-R-N-I, and then the A-E symbol. Could be Turbinia, perhaps. But then I'm thinking of Charles Darwin and the Ichneumonidae, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, th so a number of times the Confessio does use the specific word Britain, or at least, you know, that's how it's been translated. For instance, here it says, and again, after a few years, I was in Britain with my people who received me as their son. And I don't know if that's referring to the part of his journey where eventually Patrick makes it back home, but then to the dismay of his family after receiving a vision of the, uh, the figure 
Victoricus, I think, who gives him a, a letter from the, the Irish. He decides to return to Ireland as a missionary, and I think that's a- after studying for the priesthood or uh, to become a, a clergyman or cleric. But even though tomorrow, I believe, is St. Patrick's Day, I didn't intend for this to be a St. Patrick's Day episode. I've spent more time than I necessarily wanted to on this uh, this one piece of feedback. So, so let's move on to the next batch of feedback. And this was in response to episode 279, Does Jordan Peterson Believe in God? And there was this one person who definitely didn't seem to be a fan of the uh, of the video or episode. And uh, I don't think this is doxing since she uses... Uh, well, uh, th- this could be an alias for all I know. But her YouTube handle is Deborah Charles Clay. You keep making these videos about JP, Jordan Peterson, because you can't keep up with him. His views on women, trans, fashion are right on point. Gender relations are in the trash right now. It's good for women to take responsibilities. It's good for women to take responsibility and think more deeply about these issues. We can only go up. And so I responded, Deborah Charles Clay, I keep saying there's much I like about him. Just because there's some issues where we don't see eye to eye, how does that translate to my not being able to quote unquote keep up? And then um, I want to apologize to two listeners I regularly interact with. I consider them friends and listeners on the Weekend Out Facebook page because they're here too. At least I think it's them. Um, and I, I, I gave them kind of a shout out on the Facebook page. And I don't know if they want me calling attention to their names or not. Um, and I guess in a way I'm about to make the same... Uh, commit the same transgression again. But uh, the person is going by D. Pax, so you'll, you'll know who they who you are. And they say, Deborah Charles Clay, I once saw a kid who constantly made videos about Minecraft. I wonder if it's because he couldn't keep up or if it's because it was a fun and interesting topic. And that's a really good point. Um, I don't even know if that's a logical point in any way that she was trying to make there that I make Jordan Peterson videos because I can't keep up with his thinking or whatever. Um, I make Jordan Peterson videos because whatever issues you may have with the guy, I think he's an interesting thinker and I do enjoy listening to him talk about things like psychology, mythology, the power of symbolism, etc. Um, and sometimes he'll say things that are kind of controversial or divisive, and I'll chime in and add my two cents. And, and yeah, as a non-believer, I do find his kind of witchy-washy, ambiguous approach to religion to be kind of vexing or perplexing perhaps um and after i released the patreon bonus content i mentioned at the top of the show hopefully it'll be a long time before i i do another jordan peterson episode all right for you for those of you out there i know there's a couple of you who are getting sick of uh the topic but yeah it's a good point they make i cover topics that sincerely interest me or that i enjoy talking about so I think that was uh, a great point with the uh, the Minecraft analogy. And then she says, um, yeah, she, she uh, left like three comments on the video. Then she says, pushing atheism, what's the point? And I responded, Deborah Charles Clay, I don't think of myself necessarily as pushing atheism, but rather trying to promote truth and reason. From what I can see, the religions of the world are man-made, and evidence for the existence of a specific deity or an afterlife are scant. I'm open to being convinced otherwise. Okay, and here's her third comment. I guess you have not had any spiritual experiences, doubter, with a capital D. Perhaps you have never been on the brink of death, have never been at a birth or death. I have. It's certainly mysterious, but very real. Real, I mean, that's kind of subjective or open to interpretation. More real than daily life. I hope you awaken soon. 
Yeah, actually, I now I think about it, I have been on the brink of death. I overdosed on Ativan when I was in eighth grade and almost died. I don't know if I ever talked about that on the show. That's a pretty uh, wild story. Then I responded, Deborah Charles Clay, that's quite the assumption. I've had plenty of powerful and moving life experiences, some you might even deem transcendent. And ironically, it was my lifelong fascination with spirituality and religion that led to the atheist posi- that led me to the atheist position. Agnostic atheist, technically. The more closely you examine religion, the more you see the man-made nature of it. And then a uh, friend and listener, she's using her, her name here. Uh, on YouTube, so hopefully she doesn't mind. Jody Mack. More real than daily life? Really? Do you hear voices? Do you realize many atheists are former Christians and other religions? People who were once quote-unquote awakened? People who, upon giving up their childish beliefs and magic, realized those experiences they thought they were having with a god were imaginary. So I really like that comment, too. And uh, so here's D. Paxed again. Phil, you're now the capital D doubter. You've been crowned, and I say you deserve far more subs as the newly dubbed quote-unquote doubter with a capital D. Joking aside, this lady seems to not have encountered any arguments against the existence of her god before. Just look at the trees. Haven't you ever watched the sunrise? You think everything just came from nothing? Then FFS, yawn fest. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, just excellent stuff. I really appreciate those comments. And I love interacting with those guys, not just on YouTube, but on the Weekend Out Facebook page as well. And I have to say, it was kind of heartwarming. I got that feeling when um, a loyal friend suddenly comes to your aid because they don't like seeing you mistreated or something like that. Uh, I, I almost felt like... Um, Jody and D packs were coming to my defense. They kind of had my back in a way, and it, it was a nice, warm feeling. So, uh, thanks, guys. And so, I guess I'll do a quick couple of news stories, and we might as well deal with the big, sad elephant in the room renowned theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author Stephen Hawking died uh, at the age of 76, I believe. And I remember when I first heard the news, it definitely stopped me in my tracks. And then I realized that, well, I'm really not that sad uh, about it. And, And not because I don't care, but actually the opposite. Like a lot of other people who value science and reason, et cetera, I was a huge admirer of Stephen Hawking. And... I was also, I think also like many other people, moved by his personal story. And when I thought about how much he had accomplished in his life and how doctors thought, you know, he should have been dead decades ago. He had a very serious illness, uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, a neurodegenerative disorder. And he ended up outliving the doctor's prognosis, you know, by decades, and uh, lived to the relatively ripe old age of 76. And so I, I, I kind of chose to focus on the, the positive things, like how he beat the odds, how he managed to surpass his life expectancy, like I said, by decades and decades And on, you know, how much uh, the guy gave to the world in his role as a cosmologist and theoretical physicist, as a scientist in general, and in a sense, I guess, uh, as a science communicator, because of the way he helped popularize science in general, and specifically popularize some very weighty scientific ideas in the realm of theoretical physics, etc., Oh, yeah, before I forget, there were some people, including uh, Tim Danaher, who I mention a lot on the show, who were quick to point out these kind of airy synchronicities, like the fact that uh, Hawking had supposedly passed away on Pi Day, and it was also Einstein's birthday. And some other people online were kind of equally quick to... <laughs> rain on that parade and argue that 
I guess technically, I don't know if this is true or not, Stephen Hawking uh, passed away when it was still technically the day before. So he may not have technically passed away on Pi Day slash um, Einstein's birthday. I'm not sure at the, uh, what the truth of the matter is. Okay, from what I can see, all the accounts that I can find say he died on March 14th. And March 14th is also Pi Day and also Albert Einstein's birthday. So I don't know if time zones or something or what comes into play. But as far as I can see, yeah, it looks like um, that's correct. I, I mean, I think it's kind of a nice sentiment to draw those connections but as a uh, skeptic, a non-believer, I don't know if there's necessarily anything uh, spooky about it. You know what I mean? But it is nice to think about it that way. Oh, yeah. And I, I almost forgot another thing. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But I was about to say as to be expected. But there's actually uh, more of this kind of stuff than I expected, to be honest. Um, a lot of kind of fundies kind of hateful religious folks came out to kind of dance on Hawking's grave. There were a number of videos on YouTube about Stephen Hawking burning in hell. And then I saw this tweet from Richard Dawkins, which I posted to the Weekend Out Facebook page. And here's the original tweet. Hashtag Stephen Hawking. And it looks like it's from someone named Positiva dot t t e a hashtag stephen hawking is probably in a very uncomfortable hot all caps place at the moment but he made his own choices in life now he'll have to live with it for eternity to come forever too late for him now his smoke will go up forever all caps and ever and no i'm not judging this is reality he rejected the one and only god who could give him access to heaven and everlasting life for eternity too late for him now and then richard dawkins replied Hate at this pathological level demands explanation beyond the obvious low intelligence. I suggest that God nuts are secretly unconfident of their beliefs and mortally terrified they might be wrong. This translates into hyper-extreme hate of anyone who credibly boosts their doubts. Okay, then some people uh, commented on the Weekend Out Facebook page. First, we have friend and listener Leanne Backstrom. Hope she doesn't mind me uh, mentioning her name. Not judging, not telling the truth about that. Why are they always so happy about the thought of people suffering? Surely it's a sin, all this smugness. And then I replied, I think I did an episode a while back on something called the abominable fancy. The idea of the saved being able to look down in enjoyment at the damned in hell. Uh, and then Lancelot Smithereen says, It's the very definition of an abusive relationship. Love me, obey me without question, or I'll make you suffer forever. Well said. Okay, so I have to admit I was debating whether or not to even go into this next story again. It's a follow-up on that disturbing story about the girl on meth who ended up... Um, Gouging, I don't know if gouging is the right term, but basically removing her own eyeballs. And uh, now she's left blind. Uh, the girl came out already and, and she's, um, I guess she's made some statements or done some kind of interview. And remember, I, I was kind of morbidly wondering, like, even if you want to, how the heck could a person remove their own eyes? You know, um, and I know this is probably going to be really graphic. It's kind of a bad note to end on, probably. But uh, it, it did kind of capture my morbid curiosity. Remember, I was also wondering, like, for her sake, I'm like, well, if, if she removed them and they were like these perfect spheres, could they still have maybe have atta reattached them for her or what, you know? And I thought maybe that was naive. Maybe she had literally gouged them out. But here's what it says. And this is in her own words. I got on my hands and knees, pounding the ground and praying. Why me? Why do I have to do this? I later realized this wasn't a personal religious calling. It was something anyone on drugs could have experienced. 
next a man I'd been staying with who happened to have a biblical name, drove by and called out the window, I locked up the house, do you have the other key? A sign, I thought, that my sacrifice is the key to saving the world. So I pushed my thumb, pointer, and middle finger into each eye. I gripped each eyeball, twisted and pulled until each eye popped out of the socket. It felt like a massive struggle, the hardest thing I ever had to do. Because I could no longer see, I don't know if there was blood, but I know the drugs numb the pain. I'm pretty sure I would have tried to claw right into my brain if a pastor hadn't heard me screaming. I want to see the light, which I don't recall saying. And restrained me, he later said when he found me that I was holding my eyeballs in my hands. I had squished them, although they were somehow still attached to my head. So absolutely the stuff of nightmare. Um, and as I think I said to a friend on the Weekend Out Facebook page, you know, it's the type of thing where if I had seen it in a horror movie, I probably would have found it too over the top and I, I would have doubted uh, how realistic it was, you know, but here it is, real life. Um, but I'm glad that the girl seems to relatively speaking be coping and she was even talking about how she still has a dream that she wants to fulfill of becoming a marine biologist and obviously due to her blindness she's going to be greatly hindered to some degree but at least she, i mean she seems like a well-spoken young person and she still has her mental faculties and she, and she sounds you know fairly intelligent so i think there's probably still a lot she could do and accomplish as a marine biologist just by employing her intellect you know even if she doesn't have her eyes so i hope that uh that dream does come true for her and i guess with that being said i'll call this episode a wrap and uh, thanks, guys. You know the drill. Please like the Facebook page. You can follow the show on Twitter. You can check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that now. If you want to help out the show monetarily, if you uh, you know if you appreciate what I do here, uh, you can go to Patreon.com/slash The Weekend Out and support the show for as little as ninety nine cents a month, and stop anytime you want. And there's my Chihuahua snoring in the background. All right, guys. Until next time. Thanks. Oh yeah, and if you can manage to forget that last story for a bit, uh, have a happy St. Patty's Day. Mm -hmm.